This is Father Gregory Pine. And this is Father Jacob Bertrand Jancic. And this is Father Bonaventure Chapman. And welcome to God's Plenty. Thanks to all those who support us. If you enjoyed the show, please consider making a monthly donation on Patreon. Be sure to like and subscribe to God's Planning wherever you listen to your podcasts. So here we are, humming on down the old highway of Lenten life. Uh, we arrive at the fifth Sunday of Lent. Uh, not only is it a great time in this liturgical season, but it also marks three years since the beginning of the pandemic. So many people are probably traumatized to even hear mention of that past thing. Uh, but uh, I thought that we would revisit it briefly because we're heading into this, this great liturgical season of Easter uh, in light of, I'm going to stop preluding. Okay, so the idea is this, uh, maybe some liturgical pro tips for the post-pandemic world. Um, people are kind of getting back into the swing of normal Catholic life, you know, like you might see hand sanitizer, like lurking in corners of your church and not know how to interact with it. So I don't know if you guys have thoughts about ways to reintegrate your ordinary liturgical practices. Father Jacob Burchin, a first thought or a second thought or all thoughts? Um, all thoughts, throw out all hand sanitizer because it doesn't matter. Uh, it's not part of the liturgy. That's one thing. It's not a liturgical right to sanitize one's hands. Um, and that's kind of it. I think, you know, that's my reintegration into the liturgy. Um, yeah, I don't know. Are you wanting more specifics from me? Or no, I think, great. uh, I, I think it's interesting. We were all together during, um, the pandemic when it first hit the the glories of it and we were doing uh drive through confessions remember that at saint at uh john paul yeah, it was, the second it was cold. Uh, yeah, trying we're outside and all this and i remember i remember standing there and talking to you father gregory and saying by easter we'll probably be back in church <laughs> but i mean if necessary Pentecost, obviously pentecost uh and then the great sadness descended um so yeah. we're like i remember we were because we were all at the station house and doing these these uh yelling at at pen as people were yelling from car windows and we were yelling back the uh the the formula of absolution uh it was that was you know was a delightful time there was something there was something about that time that uh was a thing <laughs> certainly memorable certainly yeah memorable. um but for liturgical pro tips uh I'm now gonna... that we're getting back and uh, in a lot of churches they were during at least during during the pandemic and such, there was a hesitancy by some people to receive in the tongue and such. Uh, but now that we're back, it's kind of over with that, I think. And hopefully uh, there's, that option is available to you again. You're always available. That option is always available to you, uh, depending on how forceful you want to be about um, your rights. But uh, <laughs> now it's possible, again, I think, norm in normalcy to receive this thing. And so a good reminder to people that... Uh, when you receive in the tongue, you, you, if you haven't done this, you should try it. It's great. Um, and it's the, I think the best, you know, most reverent way to receive it since, uh, then the Lord has received right into you as opposed to you giving yourself communion as well. Although it's perfect. That's acceptable. Um, but when you do, uh, make sure that your mouth is just wide enough, you know, just open enough so that we can get him in there past, uh, past the teeth, uh, and leave the tongue out there just for us just a nanosecond longer so that he doesn't like, you don't like snap him back like a lizard. That's my pro tips. <laughs> Tremendous. This intro segment has become, has become hot takes with Dominicans on reception of Holy Communion. So maybe actually on a, on a mildly more sober note, mildly more sober note, when will I learn to speak English? Hard to say. Um, you know, know this, that you do have the right to receive on the tongue or on the hands. The church gives a preference to reception on the tongue and that you know, the basic idea is to receive the Lord reverently and to minimize the occasion of Eucharistic desecration, you know, that particles of the Lord might fall to the ground or that the whole host itself might do so. Um, so that's the basic idea. And then if you do receive on the hands, make sure that your hands are flat, that they're not moving, and that you provide, you know, like a, a kind of like worthy throne, as my second grade teacher instructed us for reception of mm -hmm. our Lord. So those are just some simple things. So from from liturgical pro tips to hot takes to sober catechesis, we are now ready to head into this fifth week of Lent as we meditate on the scripture readings for the Sunday liturgy. So with that, we'll begin with a collect from today's Mass. Let us pray. By your help, we beseech you, Lord our God, may we walk eagerly in that same charity with which, out of love for the world, your Son handed himself over to death 
through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God, forever and ever. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, so uh, we're going to get started here with the first reading. Send it over to Father Jacob Bergen. From the book of the prophet Ezekiel. Thus says the Lord God, O my people, I will open your graves and have you rise from them and bring you back to the land of Israel. Then you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and have you rise from them, O my people. I will put my spirit in you that you may live and I will settle you upon your land. Thus you shall know that I am the Lord. I have promised and I will do it, says the Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So I think here it's fascinating that God makes a promise of resurrection, and it's a resurrection that is to lead the people back into the land. So we recall from an earlier week in Lent where we started with the promise given to Abraham in Genesis 12, and the promise entailed a variety of things. So there was land, there were descendants, and there were blessings attached. All nations will bless themselves in your name. And so we, we see here that, that a resurrection is promised, but it's not a resurrection to some kind of abstract science fiction-y state. It's always to return the people of Israel to the land because the land is this like situatedness or it's the place in which worship unfolds. So you recall uh, during the Babylonian exile, the Israelites took with them the very soil on which they had worshiped previously, and they brought it with them into exile. So that way they would have, you know, terra firma, solid land. Uh, so they could have that place from which to worship their God in continuity with how they had worshipped him before. So I think that, you know, when we think about the resurrection of the dead, as we conclude the creed uh, each Sunday or solemnity, uh, it's not so much like a strange addendum to our Catholic faith, but it's the logical terminus of the fact that we as human beings, body or soul, are called to a life of worship. And insofar as our Lord Jesus Christ uh, you know, calls us to worship in his body, he will bring our bodies back into the mix in order to achieve that unto perfection. This prophecy of, of Ezekiel is, of course, given to the people in exile. They're away from their own land, and then, in a sense, they're away from the land that they should be in because they're dwelling in graves. It's made to people who are in graves and promised that they will not be always in graves. It's addressed to those who are hearing this word of Ezekiel, but of course, addressed to those of us after him as well, that sometime in the future, sometime in the future, something will happen. There'll be a resurrection and people will receive back their world and their life and their loved ones and all of this. That day came about, of course, on Easter with the opening of one grave in particular, and then of course, the other graves involved in that. Jesus Christ comes back to those who are scattered and lost to himself. I think it's a great comfort to us that one whom we call, he calls his people, will not be lost. That death is not the last word. An alienation and even annihilation is not the end of man. No, we are promised a promised land, as Father Gregory said, a, a, a place of dwelling with a body. And what's interesting about this passage, too, though, is it's not just a reception from below, in the sense that the soul will be reunited with the body as the graves are open and bodies come back to souls, whatever that is up to, uh, but also a reception and reunion from above. For my people, I will put my spirit in you that you may live. So in a sense, it's an addition, not only just a re-addition of the body to the soul is the promised land, but the promised land is to be living with God the spirit in us. It's a reminder that we're coming back not to this world post-fall, but rather returning to the pre-fallen world in a sense, in a vision where God wandered among the garden and spoke to Adam and Eve that this will be our experience. So the promise here is not just that we get back our bodies, but rather that the spirit comes to us as well and makes us live in him such that we are body, soul, and with him spirit in this promised land, no longer lost, no longer alienated, no longer annihilated, no longer wandering about, but rather walking about with our Lord. Perhaps I should have gone first in this triptych reflection on the prophet Ezekiel, because 
I don't know, maybe it's better to start with a little doom and gloom than it is to end with doom and gloom, but because Providence has ordained it such, we're going to end with a little doom and gloom. But keep in mind what Fathers Gregory and Bonamitra have just said. I think that Ezekiel's um, Ezekiel's prophecy here is a good reminder of the reality of the deadliness of sin, um, that we are, um, that, that people, of course, this is prefaced on our salvation is prefaced first on the fact that people are in need of salvation. And as Ezekiel puts it, um, that they are in their graves, they need to be risen from their graves. I think we're, it's all too easy for us. I think we, we live in a world that kind of conditions us to shy away from, um, looking at faults to from looking at the reality of sin from sort of perhaps relativizing blaming others being a victim mitigating our responsibility or culpability culpability in our actions um, but if the reality is that that hell exists and that sin exists then we the reality is that we need to preach that and be aware of that in our own lives that our sin when we offend God has deadly effects now if if that were where the story ended, that would be a pretty, yeah, doom and gloom spot to to finish. Perhaps, God willing, it won't be, but it might be where the story ends for some. But the story ends, in, as Father Bonaventure and Father Gregory was saying, in the incarnation and the resurrection. But in order to beg for a Savior, we first have to recognize our, our sinfulness, which in part is the reason for the season. Of Lent, to take time to recognize our, our need for a savior, to do penance, and to beg his mercy, but with the sure hope that he comes. For those of you keeping track at home, that is our first rhyme of the day. Uh, don't be surprised if there are further rhymes to follow. We're going to turn now to our second reading, which is taken from the letter of St. Paul to the Romans. Brothers and sisters, those who are in the flesh cannot please God, but you are not in the flesh. On the contrary, you are in the Spirit, if only the Spirit of God dwells in you. Whoever does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is alive because of righteousness. If the Spirit of the one who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, the one who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies also, through his Spirit dwelling in you. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Spirit seems to be the star of the week, or at least the first two readings, um, being put into the people as they are raised uh, in the first reading, and now in St. Paul's letter, giving us Christ, giving us Christ, the promised one uh, in our lives. The Spirit is the Spirit of Christ, of course, the third person of the Blessed Trinity who brings us the second person of the Blessed Trinity. He's not a showy sort of fellow. Um, he's not one to draw attention to himself. Uh, though. So we, like children at Christmas time, are often more focused on the gift than the giver, uh, but on, on Christ than, say, the Holy Spirit, I think. And yet he is the sanctifier. He's the third person who brings us these gifts, the one who raised Christ from the dead and raises us from the dead, as we heard in the first reading. The gifts, the fruits, the inspirations of the Spirit are not to be taken for granted, uh, even though they often are. For they are gifts that bring us into contact with Christ, not just giving us sort of superpowers, you could say, but giving us a super person, giving us Christ in our lives. And because our, of our body's deadness and our deficiencies, our lacks, because of our world-bound desires, our focus on that ground to which we go to in death, we need the Spirit to raise not only our bodies up uh, at the end time, or at, at, our, at the resurrection, but also now to raise our minds from the earthly matters and to inspire us to look to Christ on our way to the Father, brings us back from the earth to Christ, to the Father. So come, Holy Spirit, and enkindle indeed the hearts of your faithful with the heart of Jesus Christ. Well, with respect to Ezekiel in the graves, here we have the invitation to life. So deadliness of sin, invitation to life in Christ through the Spirit. Um, it's the whole reality of the Christian of the Christian existence, of discipleship, of faith in, in our Lord God, um, that he is the one that raises us from the graves, invites us to share in his life, uh, brings us to that life. In fact, he says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Lent is a good time to reflect on what that means, because 
if they're just words that we hear, if, you know, life in the spirit is just something we hear and we don't reflect on, then it's, it's kind of dead in us. But it's important to reflect on what does life in the spirit in Christ in his church mean? Well, first of all, it's a life of mercy, one that's received um, from our Lord's, particularly in the sacrament of reconciliation. It's a life of freedom from sin, although that may take a lifetime to be freed from our sins. It's one that pursues that freedom to live a life of virtue. Um, and it's one that has every confidence in this freedom in this life, not because not because I say so, who cares what I say, and, and not because simply the church says so, but because Christ says so, because Christ testifies to this reality in his resurrection and in the promise of the Holy Spirit that that in virtue of our of our reception of his grace and of our baptism of receiving Holy Communion of our confirmation of reconciliation of all of them, we're invited in a real way to share in this life to share in the life of the Spirit. Uh, so I'm impressed in reading these particular passages, obviously, we're focusing on the resurrection in anticipation of the resurrection of Easter Sunday, but also this fifth Sunday of Lent, we are going to culminate with the reading from John chapter 11 with the resurrection of Lazarus, which is the greatest of the six signs which precede the fullness of the seventh sign in the Gospel of John. So we're thinking very intensely about resurrection. And you'll see, you know, a certain tendency in the 19th century and in the 20th century to spiritualize this teaching, to say, well, it couldn't possibly be a real resurrection or a bodily resurrection. What we're talking about is like a resurrected understanding on the part of the disciples with respect to Christ, who is himself, dot, 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 yada, yada, thus and such, okay? Uh, but the church, um, in her orthodox teaching, has always insisted on this being a bodily resurrection, a real resurrection. And it's fascinating that um, the church maintains a teaching which is, which is at once very bodily, or very corporeal, and then very spiritual. Uh, so you don't let go of either element, as it were, of the proclamation of the faith, that it corresponds to human beings, body and soul, and that it itself uh, involves a kind of transfiguration of our Lord Jesus Christ, body and soul. Uh, so I'm, think I'm thinking here of, you know, Father Bonaventure broached the topic of the Spirit, thinking about how the Spirit is operative in this particular text or in this particular passage, and putting that in conversation with um, elsewhere. St. Paul will write that we as the Church are the body of Christ, and that together with Christ we are constituted as members and head, respectively. And so you'll find Fathers of the Church, medieval theologians, talking about the Spirit as the quote-unquote soul of the Church. And they'll admit, you know, this is a kind of analogy or it's a metaphor. It only fits loosely. It's not to be taken in the strict sense. But there is something to be said for the fact that it is the same spirit who animates Christ and who animates the church. So, you know, I'm not just talking about a kind of religious poetry here, but there's a sense in which our, our Lord Jesus Christ, you know, the only begotten son of God with his human flesh, breathes forth the spirit in his creation, sends the spirit to us, his body, his church, and, and as a result of which he animates us with the same life, you know, with the same grace, with the same virtues, with the same gifts of the Holy Spirit. And so this is further occasion for us to insist on the intimacy and the sublimity of our union with our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, so like these biblical images that we return to with frequency, I am the vine, you are the branches, no longer Christ who, excuse me, no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. These are real things, right? These are, these are genuine, you know, effects or fruits of Christ's desire to take our human flesh, to suffer, to die, to rise bodily, really, and then to impart his life to us through sacramental means in the life of faith so that we can share in it unto ages of ages. All right, with that then, let's turn to the gospel. Father Bonaventure. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Now a man was ill, Lazarus from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. Mary was the one who had anointed the Lord with perfumed oil and dried his feet with her hair. It was her brother, Lazarus, who was ill. So the sisters sent word to Jesus, saying, Master, the one you love is ill. When Jesus heard this, he said, This illness is not to end in death, but is for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that he was ill, he remained for two days in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to his disciples, Let us go back to Judea. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just trying to stone you, and you want to go back there? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in a day? If one walks during the day, he does not stumble, 
because he sees the light of this world. But if one walks at night, he stumbles, because the light is not in him. He said this, and they told, and told, then told them, Our friend Lazarus is asleep, but I am going to awaken him. So the disciples said to him, Master, if he is asleep, you will be saved. But Jesus was talking about his death, while well, they thought that he meant ordinary sleep. So then Jesus said to them clearly, Lazarus has died, and I am glad for you that I was not there, and you may believe. Let us go to him. So Thomas, called Didymus, said to his fellow disciples, Let us also go to die with him. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, only about two miles away, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them about their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went to meet him, but Mary sat at home. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been there here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, Your brother will rise. Martha said to him, I know he will rise in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus told her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, even if he dies, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I have come to believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, the one who is coming into the world. When she had said this, she went and called her sister Mary secretly, saying, The teacher is here and is asking for you. As soon as she heard this, she rose quickly and went to him. For Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still where Martha had met him. So when the Jews who, had, who were with her in the house comforting her saw Mary get up quickly and go out, they followed her presuming that she was going to the tomb to weep there. When Mary came to, to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come with her weeping, he became perturbed and deeply troubled and said, Where have you laid him? They said to him, Sir, come and see. And Jesus wept. So the Jews said, See how he loved him. But some, some of them said, Could not the one who opened the eyes of the blind man have done something so that this man would not have died? So Jesus, perturbed again, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone lay across it. Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the dead man's sister, said to him, Lord, by now there will be a stench. He has been dead for four days. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. And Jesus raised his eyes and said, Father, I thank you for hearing me. I know that you always hear me. But because of the crowd here, I have said this, that they may believe that you sent me. And when he had said this, he cried out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, tied hand and foot with burial bands, and his face was wrapped in a cloth. So Jesus said to them, Untie him and let him go. Now many of the Jews who had come to Mary and seen what he had done began to believe in him. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. One of the themes, one of the many themes, I guess, of the Gospel of John, or two of them, is, is that one, as compared to the synoptics of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, John focuses in a particular way on what we would call a sort of high Christology. John desires to lead us to know Christ, particularly in his divinity, as Christ, the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity. We can think of the prologue to the Gospel of John as being the sort of quintessential um, passage that that or at least initiating us into this description of Christ and his divinity. And another thing that John desires to lead us into through the writing and the preaching of his gospel is to know Christ sort of intimately. We can think of the repeated one-on-one um, -on -one conversations that our Lord has throughout the gospel of John um, with Nicodemus, the woman at the well, the man born blind, all of these, yeah, there, there are many others, but do we have this sort of this reality here? And, and in a way, as Father Gregory um, had mentioned earlier, the, the, the raising of Lazarus is, is pointing towards, is one of these last signs of the seven signs that points towards the culmination of the sign of who Christ is and how we come to know him. So with that, um, the raising of Lazarus, Lazarus Lazarus's 
um, being called forth from the tomb shows forth to us uh, Christ's ability, one, to physically heal, right? He is God. He has the ability to control the created world, to rise, to create, to recreate, these sort of things, but also his control, his authority, his dominion over the spiritual world, over our, our, over our souls. And if we look at the reading today, this passage about Lazarus in the context of our first and second reading, where with Ezekiel rising from our graves and, and Paul speaking about living in the spirit, here we have the, this reality coming to life in the gospel. One point about this to take away, think about this in terms of our sacramental life, in terms of your relationship with Christ through his church. Right? We have the sacraments that lead us to Christ, that raise us from our graves, that invite us to life in the spirit. And there are these physical realities that we see there before us. We have bread and wine in the Eucharist. We have water at baptism. But these things lead us really and truly to life in Christ through the implementation of the use of these objects. In the same way that Lazarus has this, we can all see or they could all see Lazarus rise from the grave, but also through that Christ saves his soul. He heals his, heals his soul and in, in turn gives us the hope of the same, of resurrection in Christ after his resurrection that we are about to celebrate in just a couple weeks' time. Uh, so last night... I was in Geneva giving a theology on tap on God and the existence of evil, or as it were, the problem of evil, um, just doing something like a theodicy or like a defense. Uh, so trying to shed some light on how the existence of physical evil and moral evil is not an obstacle to God's existence or belief in God. And it's fascinating that this, this particular gospel passage seems directly addressed to that type of worry. Now, um, the first century audience wouldn't have had the same preoccupations as like a 17th or 18th century audience to whom the Odysseys in the classic sense were first addressed. And yet still, there are some serious points uh, at which the two interface. And so it, it just strikes me that a good question to ask of this passage is what is God responsible for uh, or what God could do versus what God does do? Uh, so if you think about it in terms of what is God responsible for, sometimes we put God in the dock and we make him to answer for all of our woes because we feel like he is all powerful and is all good, is responsible for maximizing and optimizing goodness and therefore alleviating or ameliorating all sense of pain or suffering in this world. When truth be told, God is doing something different. That's not to say he is entirely unconcerned for our misery. He's merciful. He is concerned for our misery, not in the way in which we are. Um, so as a universal cause, God sees to it in its grand kind of designs, but also in the particularities which you know, we each feel in a personal and, uh, and sometimes unique way. Um, so, so just looking at this particular passage, you can ask is, you know, is God responsible for sparing Lazarus this four days death? And the answer is no, he's not. He's not responsible for that because this is just what happens to created things with bodies. This is just what happens with matter. It decays. So God gave it its nature. He gave him, his friend Lazarus, this human nature with this human body, and it's bound to decay. Uh, so God is not responsible for alleviating every natural decomposition this side of eternity. Uh, you know, he was alerted to the fact, and it seems on account of, that he loves this particular individual with a peculiar solicitude, that he might be motivated to interject his grace especially powerfully or especially, you know, wonderfully. And that's what we see happen, but it doesn't happen in the way that we expect. I think a lot of times we want ourselves to be spared from or we want ourselves to be kind of deflected from any source of sorrow or pain. But God, again, is motivated by something different. He's motivated by his glory, his goodness, right? But also our participation in that. So our salvation and the salvation of those whom we love. And I think it's fast, just a simple, um, uh, like, reading of this passage, you come to discover that the name Lazarus is given to us. Uh, and when it comes to Christ's healings, I think there's only one other instance in which we have a name, that of Bartimaeus. So the fact that we have the name testifies that, that he is an eyewitness of something great, that he has been memorialized among those just who had something important to do with Christ. And so he was already, you know, kind of been drawn up into that sublime and intimate sharing with Christ by virtue of what befell him and that he was subsequently saved from. So I think that, you know, as we, as we put before the Lord our own sorrows, uh, our own pains and sufferings, we ask not so much that we might be spared all of them, 
uh, but that God's designs for his glory and our salvation might be seen through uh, in the way that he knows best. So could not the one who opened the eyes of the blind man have done something so that this man would not have died so that we would not have suffered? Surely, certainly, but he's not motivated by that. He's motivated by something bigger and better and yet more beautiful. And it's so for us to abandon ourselves to that. Each of the Gospels is indeed a, an impressionistic sort of portrait of Jesus, a rendering by the Holy Spirit through the pen strokes of human artists of Christ and emphasizing a particular aspect, you could say. As Father Jacob Bertrand said, the Gospel of John is about the divinity, you could say, of, of Christ, the God-man, uh, emphasizing, highlighting in bright pastels, pastels and brush strokes, the divinity uh, of Christ. But as true as that may be, it's not the whole truth, for the divine artist of the Gospels are also about one who is, well, the divine artist of the Gospels is also about one who is both God and man. He's the God-man. And even John's Gospel is actually a presentation not only of his divinity as much as it is, but especially here of Christ's sacred humanity. This was a man. This is a man who wept, who wept. It's a very human Jesus that we find in this passage, one who suffers the reproaches of the sisters whom he loves and weeps despite knowing and directing everything, as Father Gregory said, precisely because he knows and directs everything, it seems. He understands more fully than we do uh, the sufferings and the sorrows of our individual situations and any of these uh, contingencies. John's gospel is often is symbolized with an eagle. For the penetrating insights and the heights of divinity and power regally presented in those flying uh, birds aloft in the heights. But remember that this eagle and all eagles, this one especially though, is one that swoops down very low and comes so close as to the ground to touch it and to embrace it with its talons and even maybe damaging its own talons in this speedy descent such that it embraces dead flesh not to consume it, but to raise it, to fly up with it, back to the nest, a home where this living prey belongs truly the many mansions of his father's house. All right. With that, we've come to the end of our time meditation on this Sunday's uh, lectures. Lectures. Nope, that's not right. I'm speaking a wrong language. This Sunday's readings. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's conclude with the prayer of the people from today's Mass. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Bless, O Lord, your people who long for the gift of your mercy, and grant that what at your prompting they desire, they may receive by your generous gift. Through Christ our Lord, amen. Thanks, as always, for listening to God's Planning. If you would, in your kindness and generosity, please follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. Like the episode subscribe on YouTube or on your podcast app uh, and leave a five-star review, uh, preferably on the aforementioned platforms. But if you want to just leave a five-star review on your fridge, we will also take that. Uh, and then take a picture of it and then post it to one of those platforms. Um, if you'd like to donate to the podcast through Patreon, please follow the link in the description or in the show notes. And there you will also find links to godsplanning.org. Wow, I got so excited for the announcement that I started stumbling. Uh, you'll find links to godsplanning.org where uh, we have our retreat postings now available. So applications are open for our first retreat, which will take place in the middle of June. So June 16th through 18th at Malvern Retreat House, uh, just outside of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. So that's for all comers. Uh, so the, that's for people age 21 and beyond, 21 and older. I guess you usually say older rather than beyond. It sounds like space explorers. Um, right. So for you, uh, and the retreat is going to be about the four cardinal virtues. So the building blocks of our moral lives. We hope to see you there. We're looking very much uh, forward to seeing you there. So find the application at godsplanning.org. All right. That's all from us. Know of our prayers for you. Please pray for us. And we'll look forward to chatting with you next time on Godsplanning. <laughs>